There we go. Well, All Aaron, right. we've never spoken before. Tell me a little no. bit about yourself. Um, or well, have we in, spoken before? I, no, we haven't spoken before. Um, uh, I listen to your podcast. Uh, I guess your videos, but I listen. I listen to them mostly. Um, and I really appreciate them. And um, yeah, I thought, oh, he talks to people. So I'll talk to him. <laughs> That's true. I yeah, do. I do talk to people. I don't just live in this little <laughs> office, isolated from the world, spewing out my random thoughts. Um, I grew up in Michigan, although I live in Minnesota now. And I've lived here for, I don't know, 30 years or something. Um, uh, let's see, what else to tell you? I work in media. I um, am married. I have two college age kids. My husband is a is an excellent stepdad to my kids, and I um, have pretty much listened up until recent weeks. I've pretty much listened to everything that Jordan Peterson has lectured about, and his podcast, and I mean going back into his maps of meaning stuff, um, all of his psychology courses that he's offered. Um, so I guess I discovered Jordan Peterson a couple of, well, maybe three years ago now. And um, it's been really important to me. I've learned a lot and it's helped me with some things. I'm not your usual Jordan Peterson um, <laughs> listener, I don't think, but. <laughs> not a 28 year old man? <laughs> no. <laughs> but uh, I guess, um, let's see. Yeah, so I grew up in Ann Arbor, Michigan, which is, you know, very liberal, uh, diverse place. My father um, is retired now, but he was a uh, chemistry professor at University of Michigan. Okay. He's now a professor emeritus um, and lived there my whole life uh, until I went off to college. I went to St. Olaf College in Minnesota, which my parents had gone to and my grandmother had gone to. Okay. It's in Northfield, Minnesota. And um, is that a Scandinavian Protestant tradition? It's uh, Norwegian Lutheran. Okay. But we're Danes and Swedes in our family. So, ah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I majored in psychology in college. And my plan ever since I was a teenager was I was going to become a psychologist, become a therapist. Um, even though my dad was a chemistry professor, probably our, our best family friends, the, the, the father was a psychologist. And so I really admired him and his work. Um, I'm the middle child of three girls, no brothers. Oh my. Yeah. Um, let's see what else. I don't know. That's probably enough. Is it? So while well, you planned on doing psychology, did you get yeah. married and raise a family? And did that sort of interrupt your career? Is that the deal? No, no. I, I have actually a story and I might, I could maybe tell it to you. Um, when I was in college, I did a semester. A lot of people would do a semester abroad, but I chose to do a semester in Washington, DC. And it was called the justice seminar at American university. And it, I really appreciated living in Washington, D.C. and all that was there and uh, decided with a friend that I'd met on that program that after college, we would move to Washington, D.C. and work and live there for a while. And so we did. And my plan had been to go to graduate school, although I hadn't applied for it. I, I was thinking I'll take some time off. I'll work and then I'll do graduate school. And so, you know, it was all, it was all on, on course there, but my first job that I got out of college um, in psychology was at a crisis house for chronically mentally ill people. Uh -huh. And the situation was um, fascinating, informative, and not safe. So I can imagine <laughs> I'm yeah. often around mental ill people in crisis there. Yeah, it's a yeah. wild thing. <laughs> it, it really was. Yeah. So, um, you know, and it was just a strange situation where 
I, I actually bumped into a, a, an a alumni from St. Olaf that I knew on the street in Washington. And he said, oh, I work at this place and you should come in. They need a receptionist to fill in. And so I did that and they liked me. And so then they had an opening as a crisis house manager. And they said, we really think that you would do a good job at this. And I was, you know, I was thrilled um, and, and interested and took the job. It was working in a home setting with adult chronically mentally ill people in crisis, males and females, and the shift was 48 hours. So there was like a staff room that you'd go and sleep in. Um, and it was one person in the house. And it, you know, this, this company was created by two women who were really um, committed and ambitious and interested in the whole um, deinstitutionalization and all of the problems of institutionalization and how to like solve that and, and change that. And so they, you know, they were getting a lot of um, attention and, uh, you know, they were sort of like groundbreakers. And there I was <laughs> in this house and it was really challenging. And um, it, it, a few months into it, I can't even remember how many, um, there, there were a couple of different houses and, and one of the women at the other house was attacked and raped by a patient oh or a client. My. Oh my. And yeah, it was, it was just really bad. And I probably should have just quit then, but instead they said, well, you know, our problem is that we, we need two people in the house, not one. They had uh, only had one and they had a team of professionals that would go from house to house and spend time with the clientele. Yeah. And so the way they added up the numbers and divided them up, they thought that they were complying with DC law um, for the number of staff to client ratio. Yeah. But in fact, after this event, um, no, <laughs> DC yeah. said, no, that's not true. Yeah. So there were two of us then in that house and, you know, I was trying to hang in there and, and continue doing the job and just got more and more stressed and realized that it was just not safe. It was just not okay. Yeah. And had kind of a, um, an event where I'd been out shopping with the other person while the clients were all off at their day programs. And, oh, can I stop for a second here? Cause I got to shut the door. Cause the cat just walked in. Sure. Okay. Okay, I'm back. I just was like, these people are crazy. The, this, they don't know what they're doing. I want nothing to do with this. I'm, and so I thought, well, what will I do then? And I thought, I know, I'll go into television. So I made, had made some connections and got an internship in my career, then took a big change and worked as an intern waitress. Um, just left psychology in the rearview mirror, just completely. And to the point where I did not seek out a psychologist to help me deal with this traumatic situation. Yeah. I just wanted nothing to do with it. Yeah. Um, and I stayed in Washington, DC for about another year um, and got enough experience as a producer and then moved to Minnesota um, where, and got a job at a TV station. And then it was after that, that then I um, eventually got married to my first husband, had two kids, worked, all of that. Okay. <laughs> so. okay. Well, that's quite a story. My wife worked in a similar type. Um, it was a group home and uh, similar stories. I was, I was her boyfriend at the time and then her husband. And I, you know, 
I, I always felt a little bad because my wife's a lot smaller than me. And I thought these, these people wouldn't pick on me the way they're picking on her. Um, yeah. But, but my wife's pretty scrappy. So she, yeah. uh, she, I, 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 she, you don't mess with her too quickly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I was very ill-equipped for this and, um, you know, years later when I've, when I've worked on kind of healing the trauma of it and understanding kind of the story better yeah. and understanding that it was an unsafe workplace. Yeah. <laughs> that's really what it was. Yeah. It wasn't me being necessarily, you know, to something. No, <laughs> it no. was like, it's the, the, the setup was irresponsible for yeah. the kinds of people you're, you're and the situation you're placing them in. I saw that quite a bit. You're probably talking about the eighties. It was the, yeah, it was like 80, 87, yeah, 1987. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, I think I think a lot of regulation have sort of cracked down, hopefully on some of those things to sort of up the safety level for employees. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that was a big it was a big, big deal to go through that personally. And it was also a big deal to go through something where what I expected, um, how I expected to be treated, how what, you know, what it seemed like on the surface of these, you know, these great rising star psychologist entrepreneurs, um, they were, they were not, you know, they were changing a system and they were not aware of the unintended consequences of changing a system. Yep. Yep. And so the other part of the story is, um, many years later, uh, when I was, uh, at a workshop with my friend and, mentor who teaches forgiveness workshops. Mm. Um, I, I've been, I do a podcast with her, her name is Mary Hayes Greco and, but I am sort of a helper in some of her workshops because her work has been so helpful to me. I, I did a forgiveness. Um, uh, I, I decided to forgive the two ladies that, that put me in that position <laughs> and worked through all these steps of forgiveness and got to a point, you know, where I was sort of seeing, understanding the story differently and ready to let go. And in that workshop, there were about 12 people there. And the woman who was sitting next to me on the couch after I'd gone, you know, done these forgiveness steps and was telling people how it went. She was a psychologist who'd worked at St. Elizabeth's hospital in Washington, DC. And immediately she said, she was the one who kind of delivered the message. You know, you were in an unsafe work environment. She yeah. said back at St. Elizabeth's, they had all these orderlies, yeah. these big guys, you know, yeah. and they would, they were there and they kept track of the patients and yeah. they knew who was getting out of, you know, getting yeah. agitated yeah. <laughs> and they would be the ones to tell the psychologists and psychiatrists, Hey, watch out for so-and-so. Well, in this new system, you didn't have those that. People, they weren't there. They weren't there at all. Yep. They were completely missing in action. Yep. Um, they'd been written out. Yeah. And I just was like amazed. I was amazed at that. It was 28 years after, you know, my experience, my traumatic experience that I had to work, you know, different yep. points on healing. Yeah. <laughs> So I, that was just, um, I felt like that was a miracle and to decide that I was going to forgive and go through these steps and go to this workshop. And, you know, I'd done a lot of forgiveness work in, in, in other forms, but I just happened to pick that story that day. And then to have that woman sitting next to me, tell me that it just, it like the whole story changed. I understood yeah. it so much differently. Yeah. And I feel like unless I had done the work of deciding to heal it and um, forgive and let go, um, I wouldn't have gotten that. So it's a, it's a story with a happy ending, <laughs> I would say, even though it was hard. Wow, wow, it's a good story. It's a good story. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. It's a good story. And, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of Peterson-esque things in there in terms of, you know, when you're when you're changing a system mm -hmm. systems systems develop through time and they build things in and there's almost always corruption which is i think part of the reason probably they got rid of orderlies because orderlies orderlies can abuse the power that they've been given mm -hmm. it's the same mm -hmm. with cops it's the same with almost yep. any system at the same time 
they're there for a reason, which also built up historically because, mm -hmm. you know, like in my wife's situation, they didn't have orderlies there either, but, um, you know, she always wanted to work with, you know, it would, the, how she was working with was only, was only young women. And so mm -hmm. that wasn't as bad, but some of these yeah. young women had grown up in very rough situations and could be quite violent and could be dangerous. And, you know, my wife, I was actually talking to my wife about this not too long ago when she was saying, you know, I didn't, I, to, she wasn't trained in any way physically to, mm -hmm. to deal with this. And, you know, it was funny one day I was, uh, well, one of my sons was repeatedly tardy getting to school in the mornings. And um, so I was over at his college, he was going to a public school, I was going at his school and I saw a woman cop trying to restrain a student and that's, she was losing the fight. And there's a girl uh -huh. student. And I, I'm just standing there watching thinking, should I help this cop? You know, <laughs> at the same time, if I, you know, if I step in and grab that young woman and restrain her myself, I could very well be sued. Mm -hmm. So I just kind of watched it, make sure, you know, nothing really bad happens. And eventually the cop got the upper hand, but it's like, there's a physical reality all, to all of this and mm -hmm. it's complex. So anyway, that's maybe a distraction. So I, I, maybe you didn't come here to tell your story of trauma, but it was a good story. So I appreciate you sharing it with me. I actually forgot to uh, restart re-recording. So I missed a little bit of it, but, uh, oh, okay. but that's okay. No worries. It, it doesn't work. So. But anyway, <laughs> well, so well, that I, does give me a little bit of context. And yeah. well, why, why the interest in Peterson? What, what attracted you to Peterson? Well, yeah, it's so interesting because so much of what he talks, like he has listening to him and, and also essentially attending his classes that he puts out for free, his yeah. lower level and upper level psychology classes, um, allowed me to um, reconnect with psychology, hmm. which I at one point thought would be my vocation. You know, I, I it was, I had, it was a pain that I'd left behind. It was painful, you know? Mm. So that, that was it. But also the things that he talks about really have helped validate under, you know, things that, that I was sort of like, well, what, what is this? You know, I mean, I've yeah. grappled with stuff for a long time. I've tried to sort it through and understand it. And, you know, my understanding of my own story has shifted and that story is just one story. I have a lot of stories, <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, it, it, so it's been interesting to learn what I can from listening to him and what he studied and how he talks about things. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was, I was immediately drawn to it. I, uh, the way that I found Jordan Peterson, I think it, he just showed up in um, a feed, you know, like a social media feed or something sure. when he was complaining about, um, one of the Disney movies, oh. the one that he doesn't like, yeah. <laughs> uh, Frozen. Frozen. He can't stand that. And I saw a headline. It's like, why does he hate Frozen so much? I was curious, <laughs> you know. And then I read that he was he was you know really interested in Carl Jung. And so, um, one thing that I learned from Mary's work, she her her teacher was a student of Roberto Asagioli, who is um, a contemporary of Carl Jung. And so not a lot of people talk about Roberto Asagioli. Um, and I was like, oh, I wonder if Jordan Peterson talks about, I wonder if this guy, Jordan Peterson talks about Roberto Asagioli. So that was like a curiosity for me. And I, I thought, oh, I'll look up and see what else he's got, you know, on his YouTube channel. And, and I was like, holy, holy cow, there's a lot of content here. Huh. So I just sort of made it my business to start listening and see if he would reference Roberto Asagioli, which he has not. Interesting. I just so. looked, I had to figure out the spelling of it here. So I just, uh, I just yeah. got it and I'll put it in the show notes. Okay. So who is Roberto Asagioli? Italian uh, psychologist, it says, but. Yeah. He's the father of something called psychosynthesis. Huh. And really interesting person. So Mary Hayes Greco, who teaches forgiveness workshops, her teacher was a woman named Dr. Edith Stauffer, who was a psychologist who had created this forgiveness method called unconditional love and forgiveness. And uh, Edith Stauffer was a student of Roberto Asagioli's in his, in his late life um, and just adored him. And so he uh, 
was a psychologist and he does a lot of work around personal will and collective will and um, universal will. And um, there's some contemporary writers that, that address that. Piero Fiorucci, I think, has a book called The Inner Will. Huh. And it's, it's a way, like the point of psychosynthesis is within your life, you're trying to align your will thy will, thy God's will, you know, all of these different wills and kind of how do you get them all kind of working together? And so there's a lot to learn there about, you know, what, what he, I think he would call or Mary calls subpersonalities, um, you know, different motivations that sometimes are at odds with one another and, you know, figuring kind of healing all that. Um, so he, Roberto Asagioli had, has a really interesting story um, during World War II, he was imprisoned and he took the time to just learn how to be really good at meditating. <laughs> he just like, what meditated. else are you going to do? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so apparently like got out of prison, he was a political prisoner and got out and then just like picked up immediately where he left off. And um, according to Mary, Edith would say, Edith is deceased, but she would say that he just always had a twinkle in his eye. He always, you know, he, he was somebody who'd been through a lot, but just had just, you know, the, the lightness of life, right. Ever present. So yeah, the, the forgiveness method is sort of based on, on his, some of his work, but then it was Dr. Edith Stoffer, Stoffer who created it and then worked with Mary. Um, and Mary sort of adapted it. She added a step it was seven steps and now it's eight steps. So <laughs> Mary has been teaching it for 30 years here in Minnesota and all over the world and um, done a lot of work. You know, Hazelden is here. It's the birthplace of modern addiction therapy. She did, she did a lot of work there. Um, that sort of thing. Birthplace of modern addiction therapies in Minnesota? Well, Hazelden. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah, not AA. Um, that was somewhere else, but and I just know this because I'm not a 12 stepper, but in my media work, I was on a crew that was one of the first cameras ever allowed it allowed into Hazelden treatment center. Huh. And so, you know, it was just sort of this strange thing that was like 25 years ago. And since then I've done a lot, of, I've done work, like I've done videos for Hazelden and interviewed people and stuff like that. Huh. Is that because Minnesota is so your winters are so long and dark that all you have to do is drink all winter and by spring well, your life's a mess? <laughs> Probably. I don't know. It's, it's an interest. It's a curiosity of Minnesota that there's, there's that Hazelden was born here. Oh, so interesting. I don't know anything mm -hmm. about that. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like, I always, you know, obviously I like learning new things. So mm -hmm. that's really interesting. <laughs> so, so what did you, so, so what did you want to talk to me about? Well, I mean, we got about a half hour, so I don't okay. want to waste yeah. all your time on my questions, my nosiness. No, that's, that's cool. Um, so my grandfather that I never met because he died when my dad was in a sophomore in college was uh, a Lutheran pastor. And so then my, my dad was a scientist. Um, my grandmother, Lily, who was a pastor's wife, was a lot involved in our lives when I was growing up. And um, so, you know, it was this assumption of, I, I was confirmed in the Lutheran church and then, you know, have kind of been on a path of like, how does, how does this religion, how does religion fit into like my daily life of challenge and what I'm going through and how I figure that out. And it's been an interesting journey. Um, I guess I'll, I'll say that, cause I think this is something I did want to ask you about when I sort of reached out like, oh yeah, I want to do this. My... <laughs> I'll just say it's, 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 I find one of the things I find challenging is being um, not telling other people's stories when I'm telling my own story, but my own story gets intertwined with other people's stories, Yeah, you know, and as somebody who has kids who is divorced from their dad, you know, mm. it's like, it's hard, it's hard to navigate that publicly without, you know, breaking some rules that I don't want to break. Absolutely. Um, so that's been challenging, but 
um, their dad went to uh, prep school at St. John's in, in Collegeville, Minnesota, and then went to St. John's um, College. And in recent years, there's been big uh, lawsuits and um, oh, all over the years there were lawsuits, and and then there was a big investigation with the dia the Catholic Church here, and they successfully sued a bunch of the a bunch of his classmates from his prep school successfully sued for sex abuse in wow. that prep school, and you know it was a class of like forty kids, and six or seven of them sued successfully, so it was. Like, I didn't know this when I met him. I didn't know this when we started raising sure. a family. Sure. It kind of was like partway into it where friends of his started, you know, they talk about it. They talk about some something in sort of hushed tones and it was very secretive. And my ex-husband never wanted to talk about it. And he says that um, he did not experience any uh, abuse but what has become a clear come became clear to me as this all slowly unfolded over years and years was that he was in a very corrupt um, environment. And uh, I just look at the devastation of that. And I look at like, it, it just, it just was, was horrid. Yeah. And I guess, you know, I sort of a, I'm like sort of an, I like, I like institutions, you know, I yeah. like institutions and yet, and this is another thing that Peterson has speaks so well about, you know, the need for the institution to be revivified yeah. and to be brought up to date and to be dealt with. Yeah. And I guess, you know, I had no idea that um, this was going to be part of my story in my first marriage and with my kids, yeah. but, you know, I feel like when I, when I hear different leaders of the Catholic church talking about these scandals, yeah. nowhere in there, do they take in, I, I don't hear them being concerned about me and like the ex-wife of somebody that mm. was peripheral to, you know, the situation. And, you know, I'm, I'm not a victim of them, but in some ways, boy, oh boy, oh boy, have I, paid a steep price yeah. for things that were not properly dealt with. Yeah. And when I think about like, and I, I, I haven't gotten a chance to listen to the um, Bishop Barron and Jordan Peterson conversation. And I know yeah. you just published some on too. I'm really eager to hear that yeah. um, because I feel like there's still a lot of work they have to do to somehow take responsibility for some of their members and how, you know, damage they caused and, yeah. and pains they caused. And, yeah. you know, we're, we're sitting here talking and I'm in Minnesota and yesterday was the verdict in the Derek Chauvin trial. And yeah. that has been in the grips. And, you know, yeah. I feel like there's so much going on with institutions that, have to be revived that have to be looked at you know and here in minnesota it's it, it's like it's our responsibility this thing happened here george floyd was killed here yeah you know this trial has happened here and so it's it's like this uh when jordan peterson talks about um structures and and why we have institutions and then how they can decline, yep. like what is needed to address them properly. And yeah. um, I'm just, I'm very, very interested in that because even though I, why I would say, oh I, yeah, I'm a, I'm an institution person. I found myself like on the outside all yeah. the time. I'm yeah. actually sort of a disruptor and I'm an outsider. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I, I guess I wanted to ask you about that. It's, I, I love, I, I love the way you told your story because it's true. I mean, you didn't go to that institution, that institution at a, at a part of forming um, your first husband and to one degree or enough, another impacted him. Mm -hmm. 
to one degree or another that he may or may not be conscious of. And, you know, so part of, I mean, this, obviously a lot of the focus has been on the Roman Catholic Church and its institutions. I just this morning, in fact, I was reading in this book, Reformations that I've been going through, um, a story of, there was a, the, the, the author laid it out so well, there was, so in the, and the, at the same time as the Protestant Reformation, there were all these reformations going on in the Catholic Church, um, both before and after. Um, a lot of them involving the, you know, it, it's all institutional reformation. It's all institutional redressing. A lot of it addressing clergy, because obviously, I mean, what, one of the things that institutions afford is the magnification of power of certain individuals. Because, mm. and in many ways, if that individual is, no, no, there's no perfect individual among humanity here, but if that individual is good and sound and acts well, you know, shalom, blessedness, you know, is permeated and magnified by that institution. If, if there are individuals, we just talked about orderlies, if there are individuals that whose, um, personal desires are not in line or in control or in order, those things get magnified by institutions. And then when these things happen, the consequences just spill out all over the place. So in, you know, I'm not a Roman Catholic, but I'm in the Christian Reformed Church and it's an institution. And, and obviously there have been over the last, oof, there's been a lot of attention paid to the what what a lot of this sexual abuse has done in um, in institutions and and the the collateral damage and it's devastating it, it just echoes out mm -hmm. and so in the Christian Reformed Church part of the what, what has, and this is very interesting because it is connected with a lot of the Peterson stuff. So then the natural reaction of the institution is clamp down. So now suddenly we have additional systems of control and you establish in the denomination, a safe church office. And increasingly there's the desire to have everything go through that safe church office. So that we'll make very, very sure that this thing never happens again. Mm -hmm. The irony of this is that this is when, when, when you do this thing, you set up the next manifestation of abuse. It might not be exactly like the previous manifestation of abuse, but what, what you do is you, you know, here we've built a, a monolithic power with a not monolithic institution with enormous power and it's been corrupted. So we're gonna build another one to address the first, it's, it just keeps going back and forth. So in the Christian Reformed Church, they established all sorts of, you know, zero tolerance, uh, kind of a two strike policy with respect to ministers. Uh, if, it's, if it's a serious strike in that, if, if a minister is, is, is credibly charged with, you know, especially child abuse or something, they're done. I mean, it's, there's no coming back from that. But then you have this other collateral thing that, so then you have the, a, a situation where a minister has an affair. And then the question is, oh, can there be restoration? Well, mm -hmm. kind of the rule is restoration once, but, you know, then there's rules, is the affair with someone who's in the church or outside the church? And if it's, if it's, if they're outside the church, are they a member of another church? In other words, where they'd see the minister with, you know, in a position of power and there'd be a power differential, yada, yada, yada. And so it's almost like, but, but then once you set up a system like that, so then the minister's like, okay, I'm going to have an affair. I just got to make sure it's with a pagan, you know, it, it, things get weird. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and so now we see in, you know, longstanding, you know, history of institutional violence and racism in American society. How do you address that without basically triggering the whole thing over all over again, just the opposite side. Mm -hmm. And, 
and it's, it's very, very difficult. And, you know, I, the forgiveness work that, that it sounds like, you know, you're quite, um, you know, you're quite close to, and, and that you do a lot of, you know, to me is one of the few ways out of that, mm-hmm. because at some point you can't punish, you can't punish your way out of this or indemnify, make everything safe. You can't, Mm -hmm. and that's essentially a purity mechanism. And so what's so funny to me listening to popular conversations about this, on one hand, there's this enormous complaint about purity culture in the church. On the other hand, there's this enormous, almost, you know, this, this, this safetyism. And they don't see that the the purity and the safetyism is actually the same thing. And that if you keep pushing on this safetyism, you're going to wind up with a purity culture and you're going to just continue to get all of these dynamics. It, they'll, they'll, they, they might not be revolving around sexual abuse, but they'll, they'll develop other tyrannies that will probably result in sexual abuse because that's just a common aspect of of broken human desires that that's one of our appetites and so if you if you if you give a certain group of people enormous power those things those very reliable predictable things are going to form even when it's all an attempt to address that so Mm -hmm. what what we're what we're stuck in is to me we have to we have to face the fact that we are facing enemies we will not prevail against. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't continue to try to do better, but this sort of this sort of desire that it can be eliminated from the world. And this is true of racism. This is true of sexual abuse. This is true of many of these enduring aspects, which are really basically deeply attached to our deepest appetites and desires within us. We are never going to eradicate these things. The best we can do is try to get better without sort of stepping over this line of either, you know, in your story, it's negligence on one hand, oh, we don't need orderlies anymore. Let's get rid of them. Let's just have some poor college student in there monitoring and Surely nothing bad will happen. That's a little Pollyannish. Yeah. But at the same time, and, and this is part of what we've seen happen in the West to a degree, all of the safetyism basically creates institutions that can't function because, well, now we need three orderlies for every worker. And we'll have, we have one orderly and one person that checks up on the orderly and a massive amount of paperwork and and very quickly the the institution just ossifies and falls so i you know there's no one answer to this in that we have to have institutions and this process will happen in them and we always have to look out for them but there's no safe space and there there will not be in this age and mm-hmm. that's sort of my answer to this. So then I look at, like within the Christian Forum Church, the rules concerning clergy. Mm-hmm. And I, I look at the desire to sort of lock this down. And it's like, you know, and, and what I see then is, you know, we had a situation where one pastor, he had done some things he shouldn't have done. He had an affair. And he saw this pattern. It wasn't with anyone in the church. Yeah, he began to see this pattern welling up in his own life. He hadn't abused any children. Um, basically, it had an affair. And so he says, I want to, you know, I want to come clean. And so he goes to the institution and says, and he wasn't caught. He said, this is the pattern developing in my life. It, it went to the extreme that I actually, you know, I violated my marriage vows. I violated my um, clerical vows. And I had this affair and I want to repent of it. And I want to enter into a process of restoration and I want to be made new. And basically the church comes along and says, glad you told us you're out of here. Yeah. 
Yep, saw that coming. <laughs> and and what do all the rest of the clergy mm-hmm. learn by that? Yeah. Boy, if I sin, I better keep it to myself. Yeah. Which completely undercuts what the church should be about. And anybody who's worked in any kind of rehab or where, where, where people are dealing with, you know, trying to get a handle on themselves, trying to get a handle on their appetites knows these zero tolerance policies don't help people get better. Now, it may mm-hmm. be an argument and it may be the case that this particular clergy should never again be responsible for an institution. That could very well be. Mm-hmm. But to set that up in these zero tolerance policies, you're setting up other things then. And so that's that's what I've seen in my little corner of the world. Yeah, that's it's it's really interesting. Um and as I'm listening to you talk, and I, it's, I can see you're coming from the standpoint of the, you know, like how does an institution properly contend with this? Like what is what is what is right here? And because I sort of feel like I've been like spit out of inst, I've just been thrown aside by institutions. Like where I come from is just on the ground. Okay, me, my relationships, my children, my friends. How do I properly conduct, you know, conduct myself? What what are the ethics? What do I do? And kind of like, okay, that institution, like they're on their own, you know. Um, a, a resulting uh, effect of my ex husband's experience was that he essentially trained our children that, you know religion is wrong, <laughs> the Catholics are, you know, don't, don't trust them, um, to the point where on two different occasions, I, I, walking into the grocery store with, with my daughter once and walking into the grocery store with my son once, and we walked by the Salvation Army kettle, you know, and the out, person out ringing, and each one of them said to me, oh, we don't give money to them, and I said, why not, this was after I was divorced, he said, dad said that, dad said, they make people pray before they'll feed them like like it was a terrible thing you know like and and i see that and i and so it's like okay i'm a i'm a pastor i've yet learned how to make anyone pray (laughs) well i you know we've had long conversations about it but like basically my children were indoctrinated into um resentment and and anger over church and religion so you think about like bishop baron wondering why people are leaving the church you know like my children never got there yeah you know and so you know it's like well maybe prayer let's talk about why you would pray you know and and i just go at it i don't go at it like a church says to do this or the bible says to do this but i'm like oh you're anxious oh you're feeling anxious oh okay well try this you know, try imagining that there's a benevolent force that you can like, you know, give yourself to yeah. that, that will help you, you know, yeah. it's very much on the ground, very much on the ground and using language that doesn't, you know, stumble into uh, that anger, or resentment, or whatever you call that, the, 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 keep that away from me. And I I find it all really interesting because um, again, going back to what Peterson is doing and, you know, you've stepped up to that to be a person who can help have conversations about that. What, you know, he says he catches people's attention. They start wondering, they start, you know, you're continuing the conversations with all that through what you're doing on YouTube and all that. It's like the necessary stuff, but it's like, picking up the slack for what institutions haven't been able to do for themselves yeah. or, or do to provide. And so like, if, if you were to ask me what religion I am, it's like, well, you know, I am, I am a woman of faith. I am a woman of faith. And I say, thank you, God. I trust you, Jesus. I, those are, that's my, my place. But um, I got there out of necessity and it's usually where people help. Yeah, exactly. people and the same for your kids. I mean, because in yeah. some ways, the, the bias built into them is secondhand. Yeah. Which means that it's less than it is for your ex-husband. 
Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. Because, you know, once you, once you tell children, well, those religious people, they're, they're tyrannical and tyrant, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're tyrants and they're domineering and they're forced people. And then they actually begin to meet some religious people. They're like, Hey, wait a minute. Mm-hmm. They're not like that mm-hmm. necessarily. Some of them are, some of them aren't, but that's tyranny is all over the place, religious yeah. and non-religious. So, yeah. so in the case of your kids, I mean, and you know, if they're, if they're college age, they've just begun and it's almost always our troubles. It's almost always our troubles that lead us to you know, Anne Lamott says, you know, my two, my two most prayed prayers are thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And help me, help me, help me. <laughs> and, that, and, and it is that, it is that need from which we finally say, okay, Lord, I'm going to, I, I, I can't do this. You know, I yeah. need help. And that begins a process by which we then, okay, who helped me? And yeah. how do I say thank you? Yeah. And then we kind of go from there. Yeah. So I think your kids will probably be okay. <laughs> because the truth is, you know, even though, you know, you and your husband split, kids, they might not even know it themselves, especially even say in their teens and twenties, early twenties, but they know a lot. Yeah. And they know a lot of truth about you and your ex-husband mm-hmm. and their stepfather and the people around them. And it's all full of their own filters and experience too. But um, I, you know, the truth, the truth by definition doesn't change and it doesn't move. Mm -hmm. And when we run into it, now we can keep getting our heads bloody banging against it. But at some point we usually say, hey, wait a minute, what am I doing to Mm -hmm. myself? And, and, you know, the, Mm -hmm. you know, again, we, we started talking about this forgiveness. I mean, I know a lot of people that are like, you know, I'm not going to forgive them because that lets them off the hook. Oh, and mm-hmm. you've got them on the hook now. You seem to be mm-hmm. the one on the hook yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. and you're still on their hook and they're, they're, they're not thinking about you. Why do you, why do you cling to that hook? You know, mm-hmm. you're going to have to, well, well, I want justice. Okay. Can you bring it? Why don't, and this is, you know, for me, part of the reason you know, on one hand, we want a savior. And on another hand, we want a someone who will bring justice. And the mm-hmm. Christian story says, God will do both. And mm-hmm. we look at that, we say, well, how? And sort of like the institutional question, we say, I don't know, because I can't, you know, I can try to approximate, and, but mm-hmm. I'm really bad at it. I usually overdo one or the other. But the at least the the hope of the Christian faith is that the um, the Savior is also the one who brings justice. Mm. And again, you know, you read something like the Book of Revelation, which is full of justice, justice imagery. And but but that's the point. We can't. And and so part of uh, Miroslav Volf, a um, the guy who grew up in during the uh, dissolution of Yugoslavia and the um, the wars that happened there noted that you know it was the atheists that demanded that justice happen at their hands and mm-hmm. what that usually produced were atrocities mm-hmm. and just like when there's abuse in an institution and they ripple out atrocities ripple out I was talking to someone who is Armenian and he you know, he spoke about, I mean, the Armenian genocide that happened at the beginning of the 20th century. There are many who are just clinging to that wherever they go. You know, we're going to hold Turkey accountable for what they did to the Armenian people. They have to stand up and they have to recognize and they have to publicly state what they did on and on and on and on and on. Mm -hmm. And he now two generations later is like, I look at these people and their, their fists are clenched in it. They spend their whole lives like mm-hmm. this. And so he got to the point of saying, I need to let it go. Yeah. I, I can't bring Turkey to justice. Yeah. Maybe I'll believe that someday God will somehow address the Armenian genocide. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's uh, with uh, the forgiveness workshops and things. Um, Mary talks about, um, I mean, the, her definition of forgiveness is releasing expectations that are causing you to suffer. Yeah, that's a good definition. Yeah, and that, you know, you had expectations and your expectations might be valid and just and right, but it's, but the reality is it didn't happen that way. Yeah. So then what? Yeah. And what I've discovered in just practicing this is that when you get, when you go through all that, you get great clarity on what, what your values were, yeah. what, what your values are. And you're not giving that up. You're, you're just recognizing that in this particular situation, that didn't, that didn't happen. Yeah. And as you heal, then the situation might shift and who knows what would happen, but it's not yourself doing it so much. Yep. Um, but she, she talks about, and I've seen it, the hardest step for people to get to is step number one, which is I want to forgive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. 20 years. And then after that, two hours. Yeah. Like, okay. uh, CS, C.S. Lewis's quip, you know, everyone thinks forgiveness is a great idea until they have to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, forgiveness is wonderful. Well, what about forgiving that person? No, never. Oh, yeah. okay. No, it's true. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you talking with me today. Oh, it's um, my pleasure. Yeah. And I really appreciate the work you're doing. I, I enjoy listening to your, um, your videos when, when you, you know, break things down and, and kind of go after it, you know, like what you think and then come back to it. It's, I, I really appreciate that. Well, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate you listening mm -hmm. and I will, I will send you the recording of this and, um, okay. And if you decide that you'd like me to share it, I'd be happy to share it. I thought it was a good conversation. If you want to just keep it between us, that's absolutely fine too. It's about at least a third of my conversations are sort of in that category. Oh, okay. <laughs> and um, so that's, you're not alone in that. Okay. Okay. All well, right. Well, thanks so much, Paul. I appreciate it. Pleasure to meet you, Aaron. Okay. Bye-bye.